Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the Word of God. We hope you enjoy. Psalm chapter 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat of my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. That's what we've done here tonight. Let's all say sacrifices of joy. I will sing. Let's all say I will sing. Praise the Lord. Where are we going to do this? Let's all say in his tabernacle. Praise the Lord. Yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Let's all say, sing praises unto the Lord. Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. And there's my text. Hide not thy face far from me, put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help, leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage. He will strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you for your precious word tonight, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. You may be seated, Brother Wright. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Only wait, I say, on the Lord. Only wait on the Lord and renew thy strength. Only wait, I say, on the Lord. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and shall not faint if you wait on the lord and renew thy strength only wait i say on the lord they that wait on the lord shall renew their strength only wait i say on the lord they that wait on the lord shall renew their strength only wait i say on the lord now they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and shall not faint if they wait on the lord and renew their strength only wait i say on the lord praise the lord amen Several months ago, I preached about the secret of the tabernacle. You remember that we talked about the testimony and the covering of the testimony and the Shekinah glory of God. How many of you can remember anything about the secret of his tabernacle? All right. Now, there is always a first and a secondary prophecy and cause in Scripture. And I want to preach about the secondary cause here in the Scripture concerning the secret of the tabernacle. It is given explanation in the latter portion of the chapter that we have read, the 27th chapter of Psalms, and we can see that the secret of the tabernacle is something more than just the furniture that is in the tabernacle. 
We have made a spiritual application as to our being able to run into worship and to praise. The Bible says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. We know that the name of the Lord is part of that shelter. We also know that the testimony is part of that shelter. Because in that holy place, the holiest place of all, was the testimony of the covenant. That testimony was covered over by the cherubims. This is perhaps why David in the 91st Psalm said that we would hide under his feathers and under his wings we would trust. There is a place of security and safety in the holiest place of all. Come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. I want to say tonight that intercessory prayer is the place in God that is the deepest penetration toward the will of God you, could, you will ever find in the flesh. You will never be nearer to the heart of God or nearer to the, to the will of God or the presence of God than you are in intercessory prayer. In intercessory prayer, it is as though, though you almost leave your body and enter into a place in the Spirit where the Holy Ghost itself takes over for you. The 8th chapter of Romans tells us this. We know not how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us according to the will of God. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's all say amen. amen. We are not just sensationalists. We are not just anxious to see something for sight's sake. We're not just anxious to see something happen just so we can say it happened. We are anxious to know the will of God and to please God. Signs should follow believing. The sign should not just be for sign's sake. When they asked Jesus to show them a sign, he said it is a wicked and an adulterous generation that seeks for a sign. Sign seekers are not holy people. Holy people believe God and signs follow. That's right. Corrupt people seek signs so that they might be persuaded. They must have the sign before the believing. But the true Bible believer believes and the sign follows. Let's all say hallelujah. hallelujah. These signs shall follow them that believe. Praise God. Signs follow believing. Signs follow believing. You believe God. Do the will of God. Pray in the Spirit. Take hold of God. Signs will follow. Healing, miracles, signs, wonders of the Holy Ghost will follow. You're moving into the presence and the will of God. So we're not just praying so we can see a sign. We are praying to get in the will of God and signs will follow our praying. Signs and wonders will follow our intervention into the presence of God. I want to preach tonight about the call to prayer. We are anxious for God to do great things for us. I've been preaching to you about prayer. Uh, you probably feel that the subject has been exhausted, but it really hasn't been scratched. We talked about the two types of prayer. Let me review just a little with you. Two types of prayer, current prayers, memorial prayers. We talked about the mighty power of memorial praying. Thy prayers and thine alms have come up before me as a memorial. How long he prayed, I don't know, but he didn't get his answer the first time he prayed. He kept paying those payments on that prayer until after a while God marked it paid in full. And then the current prayers, the prayers that get immediate answers. Hallelujah. Those are great prayers to pray. Isn't that right? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I prayed a prayer for a woman in Indonesia that was a current prayer. She had a goiter that came clear out past her ear. She had a, a growth that had stretched the skin on her neck clear out until it lay it on her shoulder. And she just laid it down like this on her shoulder. She had been in the church for several years. And I watched her two or three nights while I was ministering to the people and the Holy Ghost spoke to me and told me that he was going to use this woman as a sign to the unbelievers that the, that, uh, the believing people had trusted God and that we would just believe God and that he was going to do this work. And so I <clears throat> went down to her and I asked her if she believed that the Lord could heal her body and she said yes she did and Sister White interpreted for me. And uh, I told her that God was going to remove that tumor and take it away right then. And I felt that in the spirit. And so she began to rejoice. I couldn't hardly reach out to touch her for all her rejoicing. I didn't know where to lay hands on her. She was just jumping all around and leaping because of the word of faith that I'd spoken to her. She believed it that much. So when I finally caught her 
and held her just a minute, laid my hand on it, and it was the most weird feeling to feel that skin just melt down under my hand. When I reached for it and touched it, it just kept going all the way into her neck. When I put my hand back, she was completely and totally well, normal. Praise God. Hallelujah. But I'll tell you what we had done. We would prayed and fasted for three days and laid on our faces and asked God to convince some of those gainsayers. There were people standing in the door of that compound and out in the yard looking in the windows that saw that miracle. They could see it from where they were. They fell down in the yard and began to seek God and to cry with great prayer and repentance to God. We don't want signs that are just sensational. We want something that will cause men and women to seek after God. We're not just trying to get things done so we can say we're doing things. We want the Holy Ghost to be in operation. We want the mind of God to be moving. And the only way we can do that is to move into a place in intercessory prayer so that the Spirit that knows the will of God knows how we should pray because we don't know how we should pray as we are. We're not dealing with a bankrupt businessman when we're dealing with God. The Bible said the cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. Do you know that God wants to do something for us? How many of you believe God wants to do great things for us? How many of you believe God wants to save men and women in this, in this city? Heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out devils. Hallelujah. Amen. But I preached to you here the other night that God cares when you care. Now that can be qualified. You can always say that God cared so much, he's already cared so much. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God cared so much he has already shed blood and offered the ultimate sacrifice. That's absolutely right. But you'll remember that the apostle Paul said he has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. He has given unto us. He took the ministry of mediation. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And the Bible said he makes intercession for the saints of God. The price being paid for sin already he has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, saying, Be ye reconciled to God. Do you know what that means? God has placed the responsibility of salvation for the lost in our hands. He said to his disciples, Freely ye have received, freely give. This thing is not just something for you to obtain by some means and get a hold of somehow and then sit down and die with it. You're supposed to, you're supposed to procreate. You're supposed to reproduce your experience in somebody else. The law of discipleship is that you are touched and then you go, Andrew, and find Nathan and bring Nathan back. And Jesus said to him, oh, a Hebrew, and which is no guile, an Israelite, and which is no guile. And he said, how do you know me? He said, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. God was already looking at him. God already had his eye on him, but it took Andrew to go and get him. God's looking at these cities. You hear me? God's got his eye on these cities. He wants these towns to be moved. But we're going to have to move before God moves. If that's not true, you tell me why. Massive cities all over the world lay in waste and in crime and in sin without one witness of the gospel. Tell me why they don't just find God until someone comes to preach the gospel. I'll give you the answer immediately. How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall he preach except he be sent? God's plan is that he chose. He didn't have to do it, but he chose it. That means he had a choice. That means he could have had an alternative, but he chose that by the foolishness of preaching he would save them that believe. Well, I wonder what the choices were. He could have sent angels down. He could have programmed robots. And they could have gone through the streets, turning their heads one way and then the other, one way and then the other, like little ducks walking. And they could have preached the gospel. Angels could have come, lighted on the top of the buses, stood in front of trains and stopped them on the rails and in flight could have perched themselves on the wings of airplanes or walked the corridors or the halls of our government and could have proclaimed the everlasting gospel. But he didn't choose to do that. He took the total of redemption, all that Calvary paid for and purchased, and laid it on the hot heart of 12 men and said, Now you go preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. Speak with new tongues. Lay hands on the sick. That was God's choice. He chose that we would do his work. Hallelujah. He said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth much fruit. That's God's ordination. It's not just choosing us. 
but it's finding us worthy to become a part and a portion of his program in reaching for lost and dying men. So the church of the living God is not just a quarter into which we pull men who have been redeemed and set them down like canned pears on a pantry shelf, waiting for some good day to be opened in heavenly precincts. But God has rather chosen that we become moving, motivated, forceful, soul winners, doing the work of Jesus Christ in the earth. As a matter of fact, we are to finish the unfinished task of seeking and saving the lost. Jesus said, I am not come but to seek and to save that which is lost. That's the only reason I'm here. So I thought he came to heal the sick. We healed the sick, but the purpose of even every healing was to seek and save the lost. Is that right? Hallelujah. And that's what the church is in the earth today for. He's just changed bodies, you know. The literal physical body of Jesus Christ is ascended from the Mount of Olives taken up. And while they stood around there in amazement, two men stood by them in white apparel, saying, Why stand you here gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. He's going to come again. But you go to Jerusalem. Amen. And you wait for the promise of the Father. Is that what they said? And so they went to Jerusalem. And while they were there worshiping and praising God, the Bible said that the Holy Ghost came upon them uh, with a sound as of a rushing mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting. The eighth verse of the, of the first chapter says, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's where the transformation took place. When he took that physical body away, he said, Now are ye the body of Christ, and members in particular. If you're looking for the power of God out there somewhere, you won't find it there. And if you're looking for it over there somewhere, that's not where it is. The Bible said it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Who shall ascend up into the heavens, that is, to bring Christ down? Or who shall descend down into the earth, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead? What is it? The word of faith is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, even the word of faith which we preach unto you. The very thing we preach to you gave you life, and that's the thing you need to preach. And when they hear it, they need to preach it. And when they hear it, they need to preach it. And that's where Christ is. You'll find him wherever faith is. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord together, shall we? Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. We think of miracles and wheelchair victims, you know, simultaneously. We don't know there are any other miracles beside that, or crutches, or eyes, or ears. The Lord wants to do all of that, but there are other gigantic miracles that we need performed beside that. Just to give you an idea of a different kind of a miracle, a friend of mine, Brother Escadal from New York, when he was a very young boy, told about some of the saints of God that were in prayer in a meeting on one side of the fjord in Norway. They were praying together and the Holy Ghost spoke to them and told them to go to the other side and they were going to walk out across the ice, go to the other side. There was a group of people over there who had been praying and needed help and were hungry for the Lord. So they left the place where they were praying, this band of disciples, and bundled on their winter clothes and went out and down the steep hillside and path and then out across the ice of the fjord in the cold winter time. And they went out across to the other side. When they got to the other side, they met these people who were praying. It was almost like, it was almost like Cornelius and Simon Peter situation. And so they prayed for them, and every one of them received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And so they were returning home. And when they got back to the other side, they started climbing up the path toward the place toward their homes. And some of the anxious disciples that had stayed behind came rushing down panicked and almost, almost death-stricken with pale faces and said, how did you get back over here? And they said, well, we just walked back across the ice. And uh, Robert said there was an ashen look in their faces while they said, well, you couldn't have. And they said, well, we did. And they said, well, that's impossible. While you were on the other side praying with the people, the big icebreaker came through, and it's in the harbor now. The icebreaker left a trail almost 100 feet wide in the ice where there was no ice at all, broke its way all the way up into the harbor, up into the fjord. They had walked back across. They said, well, we just walked back across here. We know that there's nothing wrong. 
they were singing and worshiping God all the way back. And one of them admitted, said, well, we weren't looking down too much. You know, we were just praising God and looking up. And so they went back to investigate. So they climbed back down the hill and went out together. And when they got out about halfway out the fjord, there it was, a strip 100 feet wide of nothing but just cold, deep ocean water. I want to tell you that there are other miracles just beside a blind eye being opened. God wants to do miracles for you, signs and wonders in your ministry. The great ministry of saints is going to explode in these cities, and it's going to happen because of intercessory prayer. We could read books all day. Brother Dutka, I've come to the conclusion that we could read books and lay down plans and work out packets and sit down in all kinds of organized group sessions and do all kinds of things, but nothing is going to work so much as the Holy Ghost becoming our teacher. Hallelujah. And taking hold of us in intercessory prayer and leading us to the hungry and the lost. Hallelujah. Woo, praise God. There is no limit, no limit to what God will do for his friends. Praise God. There's no limit to what God will do for his people who call on him day and night. I told you the other day, I don't want to sit in the back of the plane and watch the clouds go by and see the birds when we go by. I want the pilot to come back and get me. I'm going to knock on his door till he opens the cockpit and says, come on in here with me. Blessed is the man whom God chooseth and says, come on up here with me in prayer. Amen. I want to get up there so I can see the clouds before we get to them. I want to see the crisis before we get to it. I want to know in the spirit what the Holy Ghost is about to do before I have to just watch it go by. Too many saints just watch the Spirit go by, watch things happen. They never were involved in it. They weren't part of its happening. We need to move into a place in intercessory prayer where we see and feel and hear and know in the Spirit what the Holy Ghost is about to do. Oh, prayer is power. Prayer is adventure. There's nothing so exciting as prayer. You know that you're going to get an answer. Nothing so exciting as praying a prayer knowing that you got an answer to your prayer. The reason why people don't pray is because they don't get any answers to their prayers. And since they don't get any answers, they don't feel like praying, so they just go mumble the same little two words over they've said for the last 40 years. Oh, God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, God, praise God, oh, God, hallelujah. And that's the way they pray, and that's not prayer. You just wasted time. Hours and hundreds of hours are wasted and supposed prayer that are not prayers at all. Never touch God, never reach out, never get beyond the ceiling. I know some folks will differ with that, and they'll say, well, God just honor you for being in the room. He knows you're there, but that still doesn't touch him for souls. That still doesn't change the temperature nor the weather. That still doesn't change what's going to happen to a dying sinner. If you're going to change the course of human activity, you're going to intercede and touch the throne. And the only way you do that is to move from prayer through thanksgiving, through supplication, all the way into the cockpit of intercessory prayer until you see in the Spirit when the Holy Ghost takes over what is the will of God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Prayer's adventure. It must be exciting. Brother Wright drives these caterpillars down over the bank over here sometimes. I thought about it. I thought, boy, I'd love to get on there and run that thing. Just get a hold of something and shove it out of the way. Boom. Push a tree out of the way. Take a big old chunk of concrete and push it out of the way. Tractors and levers. I ride on littler tractors than that. I don't know how to operate one of those. I never tried. I probably could have if I'd have tried, but I just never operated one of those. It's great to get a hold of the handles in prayer, be able to know that you don't have to let that mountain stand in front of you. You can move that mountain. You can go through that mountain. You can go over that thing. You don't have to let circumstances govern your life. It's just like getting a hold of the handles saying, all right now, Lord, me and you are going to do something about this situation. I'm not going to live with this thing worrying my mind like this push both those handles forward and just let those tracks eat into that situation until you can feel the biting power of the glory of God beginning to move on. You don't have to let circumstances control you. You don't have to let situations bar your way from what you want from God. You say, well, I want him saved. Well, then if you want him saved, you take a hold of God. You say, all right, I want him saved. He's going to be saved. And you turn that thing right around, get right head on with that situation and say, now, I'm not going to let go until. And when you do that, you take hold of God in that way like Abraham, who stood yet before the Lord. He just moved right around in front of him, and the angels kept going, but he stood yet before the Lord. And he said, now, I want to know if you're going to destroy the righteous and the wicked altogether. You see, the thing that brought that on was the call to prayer. God said, shall I hide this thing that I'm going to do from Abraham, seeing that he shall be a great nation, and seeing that he shall train his children to walk after me, and seeing that I know him by name. 
said, I better not go down there until I tell Abraham. Come on up here with me, Abraham. Why don't you come up here in the cockpit with me? I'm going to show you what I'm fixing to do down here in Sodom. Amen? You, there's no chance for intercessory prayer if you're just going to watch it go by. It's already going. You've got to be in the cockpit if intercessory prayer is going to do you any good. You've got to listen to the tower. You've got to hear the instructions for landing. You've got to find out where the cargo is going. You've got to find out what's on board. We're going to have to find out what the Holy Ghost is up to before we can do anything about it. Blessed is the man whom God chooses. Is that right? Hallelujah. Unto thee, O Lord, shall all flesh come. My prayer shall be lifted unto thee. Thank you, Jesus. You know, hot motorcycles and fast cars and all of those extreme things sometimes, sometimes let the vim and vigor out of your system. I think a lot of that could be taken out in prayer. I really do. Intercessory prayer. A lot of the emotional frustrations that saints of God have are, are frustrations because they don't pray. Don't pray. I think a lot of that could be cured in prayer. I don't say that it's wrong to ride a motorcycle or uh, to, to run a car. I don't think we ought to be dangerous. But I, I think that a lot of things that are in us that desire power and want to feel strength, I think a lot of that we should turn into the channel of intercessory prayer. Let that be poured right out before God to receive an answer from God. Secret of his tabernacle. Well, I woke in the morning, every morning in Pakistan, in the Intercontinental Hotel. I woke to the mournful sound of a trumpet calling those Mohammedan people to prayer. <clears throat> the mosques and the uh, buildings where they worshipped had big towers alongside. And though men would go up in those towers, some of them blew horns and others just called out with their voices. But you could hear them all across the city like sirens going off at 12 noon or 12 midnight. You could hear them all over the city. It was their call to pray. Sometimes I'd be out in the daytime. Seven times a day they do this. They call calls prayer. Sometimes I'd be out around a place or so with the missionaries when that call to prayer would come. And those people, heathens, not knowing God as we know him, would get down on their knees and look toward Mecca and would would uh, bow before Allah over and over and over again. They would do this. And uh, I have watched them on the streets while we were driving down the streets. Cars pull off to the side. Men get out of their cars or their horses would stop and they'd get out on the sidewalk. And then they'd be down on their knees and on their faces with their hands stretched out toward their mosque. And there they would be prostrate for a certain amount of time. All over the city, everything came to a standstill. The carriages the few motor cars, men on horses, places of business. You'd be talking to them about buying a certain little item or so, and when you'd hear that mournful sound, you'd see them, they'd turn, they'd say, excuse me, please. And they would turn around and walk back to a familiar place, and they're on a little carpet or a little mat. They would get down to pray. I thought when I saw that, it broke my heart that men can be so diligent and, and yet be heathen toward knowledge of, of God. When he got up in the mountain, he was waiting on God. Let's all say waiting on God. <laughs> he had his mind and his spirit in that attitude of prayer. You've got to do that. You can't just be frivolous all the time. You can't be telling the latest joke all the time and then turn right around and fall down and get into a place of prayer. You can't just be ha, ha, ha all the time and expect that you're going to be a, a prayer warrior. I've never seen silly people really pray. I've never seen giddy people really get a hold of God. That doesn't mean it's a sin to, to laugh. Well, God put laughter in it. He sure did. It's not wrong to have fun. He put fun in it. But it's wrong to get in an attitude of frivolity and all kinds of vain and profane babblings, the Bible said, that just lead to more ungodliness. If you are known as the man who can remember the most jokes, you're probably not the most spiritual thing that ever hit town. If you're known as the fellow that can remember the funniest story, you're probably not the deepest prayer warrior that ever put his knees on the carpet. There's something more in seeking God than just being a friend to men. You've got to be a, a friend of God. And to do that, you've got to stay in an attitude, in an atmosphere. There's almost a loneliness about it. 
There's a, a quietness about that. There's a sobriety about that. You remember that Paul instructed the elders that they and the elders wives, they had to be sober and vigilant. Why? Because you'll never hear the call to prayer if you're always babbling and talking and palavering. If your tongue works more in laughter and in gabbing than it does in prayer, it's likely that when God really needs to ring your phone, you wouldn't be able to hear it. Amen. And the thing about it is that God forces no man to pray. Forces no man to pray. You will never be shoved down on your knees unless you already are in a spirit of prayer. You will never be drug out of some kind of carnal business you got or taken away from your housework by led by some invisible hand. Nothing's going to pull you around and say, all right, get down here. It's time for you to pray. If that were true, then there wouldn't be any backsliding. There wouldn't be any getting cold in your spirit. There'd never be a time when you miss the connection in the Holy Ghost. But there are times when that's done. There are times when men get colder and colder toward God. Wonder why their experience wanes. It's because they miss the call to prayer. The most dangerous thing you can do in your spiritual life is to sear your spiritual conscience until you don't feel like praying anymore. And that probably is the case in maybe 50% of people who call themselves apostolic or Pentecostal or spirit-filled. They have seared over that call because of materialism and carnality and busy schedules. Some of you aren't hearing me tonight, but I'm telling you things in the Holy Ghost that will make the difference in life and death in your spiritual walk with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Elijah stand at the mouth of that cave waiting on God. He's alone. Sometimes the prayer warrior is the loneliest man in the world because it just, you just lose your desire to run to the hamburger joint after church. You just lose your desire to just slap backs and holler all the time. Just eating doesn't just, it's just not as important as it used to be. And just laughing and hollering and fellowshipping is good and rich, but when it goes outside of the prayer room and outside of the auditorium, there's just something about it that just, it's a loneliness there. How many of you think you understand what I'm saying tonight? There's a loneliness there. That, that's something inside that says, Oh, God, thy face would I seek. The Psalmist David said, The Lord spoke to him, and he said, Now when thou sayest. That's all say, when thou sayest. Yeah. Now you can say, when is that going to be? I don't know when that's going to be. That's the whole key to my message. I don't know when God is going to call you to prayer. I don't know what hour he's going to ring your alarm clock. I don't know what time he's going to bid you to move from what you're doing to a place of intercession. I do know one thing. I know that he doesn't move people that didn't move before. I know that he's not just going to come back over and over and over again after you have once seared that over. I know that if you're going to hear the call of prayer, you're going to be the person that responds to prayer. Because after you've listened to it a time or two and you haven't done it, God's not going to trust you like he used to trust you. He's not going to call on you in a time of crisis because intercessory prayer is a crisis. Do you hear me? There are times when people are in danger right now, Brother Cooper. I mean right now that the Holy Ghost will say pray. And if you don't hear the call to prayer, and if it's not a trumpet out of some tower that rings your spiritual phone and says, it's time, Steve, it's time to pray. If you let that go by sometimes, some dear saint of God, somebody that's counting on God's intervention, somebody that needs someone to intercede for them, God missed you on his first time by. He's not going to waste time running down your alley next time when he's got a crisis on his hands. You say, well, God will just take care of it. God doesn't do anything until you pray. I think I can safely by the scripture say that nothing happens in the spirit until men take hold of God. The reason you're saved is because somebody prayed for you. You may not know them. You may not know who they are. You may never have met them face to face, but somebody prayed for you. If you think that God just roams around heaven looking for things to do and decides to do this today and tomorrow, I think I'll go do that. Why, uh, tomorrow evening, I believe I'll go over here and do this. You're wrong about that. No, sir. God is waiting to hear the voice of intercessory prayer. God is waiting to hear the voice of his people to move him. He's there and we're here, as it were. And we become his arms and his feet. 
We become his eyes and his ears, as it were. And we actually, having the ministry of reconciliation, do the directorship of the work of God in the earth. He has given to us the responsibility of seeking out and saving that which is lost. Hallelujah. That doesn't mean we have the power to do it, but that means we have the responsibility to do it. The Apostle Paul said, a dispensation of the gospel is laid upon me. A few years ago when the Holy Ghost showed me this, it put me on my face for days and days because I just had in my mind the picture that God knew everything that was going on. God would take care of it. God knows what's going on. But you know, I realized after a while that if I didn't pray, I didn't get an answer. And the scripture says, you have not because you ask not. Now, if God knew what I needed and just answered it because he knew it, then I'd never have to say a word. And prayer would be absolutely unnecessary. But the reason God has done that is because from the very beginning, God has planted the basic thing in man that makes him different from every other creation. And that is that man serves God from willfulness and willingness rather than from compulsion or habit. Man is the one God-type creature in the earth. The one God-like creature person in the earth who after God has the idea and the ability and the prerogative of saying uh-huh, uh-uh I will or I won't I do or I don't man can't be saved until he says I want to be saved man's not going to get right with God until he says I want to get right with God that man's will has got to be changed or the man is not changed. Jesus showed us this in the garden when he said, not my will, but thy will be done. It was the ultimate sacrifice of self. It's the only thing that could bring redemption was for the man's self, the, the, the God-man likeness, to surrender that flesh self to the mind of the spirit. Not what I want to do, but what you want to do, dear God. Not what I want to do in my flesh, but what you want me to do. Not where I want to go, but where you want me to go. Not what I want to say, but what you want me to say. Amen. And when Jesus prayed that prayer, let this cup pass from me. He was saying what was the will of the flesh. It was the will of the flesh not to take sin. It was the will of the flesh not to partake of all of that. It was the will of the flesh not to have to drink that cup. He didn't want that. Let it pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I submit to the will of the Father. I submit to the will of the mighty Spirit of God. I submit the flesh to the Spirit. That's the only way we can ever accomplish anything for God is to submit because we have the choice. The choice is ours. And since we have the power of choice, God is not going to move toward mankind until that option is exercised. He's never going to overcome the boundaries of the mind and just do things for humanity because they ought to be done. Somebody's going to pray for a lost city. Somebody's going to pray for a lost sinner. Somebody's got to pray for that lost girl. Somebody's got to intercede for that lost mother. Somebody's got to touch the throne in order for God to move. Now, if you don't understand that principle, then prayer will never be anything to you. You might as well hang it up and forget it. Because you don't know what God's going to do and what you want him to do. You say, well, I suppose God's already doing that. He knows what we need before we ask him. Does he or not? Then why doesn't he just do it? Does he know or does he not know? How many of you have a need right now? You can think of something that you need. Do you think that God knows what that need is? Then why doesn't he just do it? Come on, I want to know. That's where your prayer life is. You've been thinking, well, God knows he's going to take care of this. He's not going to do anything for you until you pray. Right. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It's not just God knowing what you need, it's you knowing what you need. The biggest job in the world is not waking God up to your problem. It's you waking up to your problem. The biggest thing in the world is not saying, Hey, God, look here what I've got. I've got a real need down here. He knows you've got a need before you open your mouth. The biggest job is not getting God to look. It's getting you to ask. 
in faith and say, I believe that if I can touch God, God will do this for me. It's not because he doesn't know. It's because you didn't touch him. Hallelujah. Worship the Lord together, shall we? Teach us to ask, Lord. Well, you remember that there was a mighty earthquake up on the mountain where Elijah was. The earth trembled and shook, and he's hanging on to rocks and trees, trying to keep his balance. And when he finally, that thing settles down, and the rocks are cracked apart, and the earth is shaking, and there's a big landslide over there, and the mouth of the cave is still dropping down some dirt. He puts his head back out there and looks around. He said, boy, this must be the call to prayer. Surely God is in the earthquake. And then comes a mighty wind and it begins to blow his face he grabs the side of the cave and moves back and I wonder if he didn't just fall down against the side of the cave while he watched trees go zipping by Boom. a big hurricane as it were a tornado throwing all kinds of things the wind blew the forest down picked up the dirt and made it look like it was just brown gray outside and finally when all of the mighty wind settled down he looked back out of the cave and said well God is in the wind but the Bible said God wasn't in the land. What was God trying to do? Trying to get Elijah to listen to the voice of God. The voice to pray. Here comes the fire crackling. The intense heat burning. Searing the landscape. Leaving it black and barren. How many hours did he lay way back in the cool of that cave? While the heat billowed in and then back out again like a furnace outside until all of the fire was gone. He went out and said, that's got to be God. That was big. That had to be God. Mm. He went out and there wasn't anything there. He sat down in the mouth of that cave and scratched his head and, and in a still, small voice, the Lord spoke to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Huh? What are you doing here, Elijah? Oh, I've been very zealous for the Lord God. I've got myself in a jam. I've been hoping you'd come help me out of this thing. I've been needing to pray and get a hold of you. The call to prayer, the call to touch God, the call that acquainted man's need with God's power was not just a blasting. We always wait for the crisis to put us on our knees, and that's a mistake. We wait for the car accident or for the tumor. Or for, for the news from Indiana. Or we wait until mother is down with, a, with her gallbladder. And then everybody gets around and says, well, you know, we really need to get a hold of God. Or else we have family problems. Or the baby gets pneumonia. Then it's time to pray. No, I tell you what, you probably find God least in those kind of times. Now, I grant you that it's time to pray when we got trouble. But I would like to grant you one more thing, that you will always have help in trouble if you learn to pray before you got trouble. We don't really know how to pray when we got trouble. It's hard to get a hold of God when you watch your mother fall down with a stroke and she can't talk to you. You just can't hardly pray looking at her. Come on now. Or when your boy is rebellious as the devil and you're talking to him and he gets you upset. It's hard to get down and pray in a spirit like that. You know that's the truth. We need a backlog somewhere. We need to have been a hold of something somewhere else. You should have prayed before the crisis came. We need to hear the call to prayer. It's not just the fire and it's not just the whirlwind and it's not just the earthquake that ought to call us to prayer. It's the little voice that says, come on, leave the washing machine. Get away from that lathe for an hour. You don't want to grieve the spirit in the call to prayer. I think that the Holy Ghost has been grieved more in the call to prayer than perhaps any place else in the world. You say, How, why do you say that, Brother Hanby? I'll tell you why. Because if we had answered the call to prayer, the Holy Ghost would have led us around a lot of this other stuff we got to fight through all the time. If we could have heard that voice, then we wouldn't be having all these other things. The Holy Ghost could have called us into the cockpit. Could have said, I want to show you what's fixing to happen up the road up here. And if we'd have taken a good look at that, we'd have said, ooh, 
I'm so glad the Holy Ghost. Let me see that. Thank you, Jesus. Know how to, I know just what to do about that situation. Grab those levers there. Okay, here we go. God, I'm going to stay here until you move that mountain out of the way. When you watch those things just go zipping by, we say, well, I'll tell you when we need, I'll tell you where we've hurt God the most. We just didn't, well, we just didn't yield in the service. You can't yield in the service if you don't yield in prayer. Nobody's going to yield to the Holy Ghost in the service if they don't yield in prayer. You may for a little while, but you won't after a while. Nobody's going to live for God very long without prayer. Lack of prayer is the number one killer, the number one killer of the church. It is the cancer of the body. That's right. More people have got it than you'd believe. They think they pray, but they don't pray. I want to tell you something else about prayer. Prayer must be a consistent thing. God would rather have you pray in 15 minutes a day than all night every 30 days. Say, well, I haven't prayed for this month. I'd say, I'm going to get I'm going to pray all night. Well, you'd have been doing better if you'd have been praying 15 minutes a day, every day, meeting God regularly, getting a hold of him every day, touching him every day, than just to try and make it up. So, well, you can't make up prayer like that. You just can't make, when you lose it, you've lost it. You don't make it up like that. You may begin all over again, but you're not going to make up for 10 or 12 days that you didn't get on your knees. I wonder how far down the prayer list, how far down the busy list is God in your daily schedule? If you got up in the morning and started writing down everything you've got to do, the first thing you do when you get up, well, you've got to get dressed, and you've got to get shaved, and you've got to... How far down the list, if you started writing out a list of everything you do in your day, how long would you read until you came to prayer? Some of you could write for a month and never write that word one time. Or if you're going to count before church in the prayer room, you needn't count that. All of us should willingly and very happily come together, pour ourselves together here in the sanctuary in the congregation. That's a wonderful and a marvelous privilege. But there's nothing in the world that is so absolutely mandatory in the spirit as your personal and private prayer life to God. That soft spirit that moves in the back of your mind and you're standing there waxing on that automobile and something says you need to pray. Well, I'll do it just as soon as I get through here. That, that's what we say, though. Because all I got to do is just finish this door. No, you need to throw that sponge down and you need to set that can of turtle shell down, turtle wax, and you need to walk right straight to a place where you can get alone with God and get on your knees in the corner of the garage. You need to do that. You better listen to that voice that calls you to prayer. The Mohammedans have better sense than just say, well, now, I'll tell you, I hear the horn, but I... No, sir. No, sir. Even the heathen are more diligent than that. When they hear the horn, they bow toward their shrine, toward their Mecca. They bow toward that mosque. Every time, if they're in the middle of selling an automobile, they're going to get right down on their face. That's right. That's right. I want to know why it is that we put God off. God is not as important as washing dishes. God is not as important, and his call is not as important as mowing the yard. What the neighbors think about how you keep your yard is more important about than what God feels about how you keep your spiritual life. How come? I want to know why it is that everything else can put God out of the way until last. Neighbors come knock on the door. Hey, what you doing? Well, nothing. I'm just, uh, no, no. What you need to do is say, You're, this is right in the middle of my prayer time. If you'd like to get down here and pray with me, you can. We put God off. He's not as important as the neighbors. He's not as important as the telephone. There needs to come time in your life where you don't answer the telephone. Some folks think I'm snooty. There are lots of preachers think I'm snooty because there are times in here I don't answer that phone. They can ring my office and knock on my door, and I just tell those secretaries, you leave me alone. I don't want to be bothered. Somebody calls, just tell them I'm busy. Tell them I'm praying. You say, well, Brother Hamby, you can always go back to praying. There's sometimes you can't go back and pick up what you're into right then. I've been in some things in prayer that one little jingle on the telephone broke off something that could have been life and death for souls. I covet the call to prayer more than anything in my life. I love it more than to hear the cry and the voice of my own children. I love it more than the tender, soft voice of my own dear wife. 
I would rather hear the call to prayer than I would hear the dinner bell. I'd rather hear a call to prayer than I would to hear that the man just got here with my new suit or that the new cedar chest just got it to the door. Anything in my life. Nothing has ever intrigued me. Nothing has ever been such an adventure to me. Nothing has ever so moved me and so excited me as to think that God could find the time and find me worthy to slip down in a small voice and say, Mark, you need to pray. You need to pray. You need to pray. Some of you are lost today because you didn't listen to that voice. Some of you are cold in your spirit today because you didn't listen to that voice. And you can start listening now from now on to eternity and never hear it again. Because once you sear that voice off, it takes dynamic sacrifice to ever get it back. You say, well, can I ever? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. But it takes sacrifice and self-determination to ever find that place where you can hear the voice of God in prayer. Let's all stand up a minute, shall we? There's nothing in the world we should be so sensitive to. Sister Hamby and I have had a, our little boy in the last two years, after ten years, been without babies in the house. She can tell you that I'm sensitive. He, he, can, just, he can just turn over in that bed in the other room. I hear him. It's like that. I hear him. And he, he can just cough a little bit, and I'll sit straight up in bed. Is he choking? I'm, my nerves, you know. I'm, I'm awake when I'm asleep. I'll get out three or four times a night and go in there. He just rolls over. I go in and look at him, make sure he's all right. I'm sensitive about that. Mothers are sensitive like that. They can hear a baby cough and they know something's wrong. Or they can tell it's just sneezing just a little. Is that right? They can tell the difference when a baby's just crying, fussing, and when there's something, a pin has come undone and sticking that little thing. They can, they can tell that. They can feel that. Feel that in their heart. Is that right? Well, there's nothing in the world we ought to be as sensitive to as it is to the voice of prayer. Is that you, Lord? Was that you, Lord? If you think it was, it was. I said, if you think it was, it was. I said, well, it might not have been. No, 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 it, it is. You say, how do you know? Because the devil won't ever tell you to pray. And the flesh won't ever tell you to pray. And if you think anything told you to pray, it has to be God. Let's lift up our hands now and worship the Lord together, shall we? Be seated. We've got to stop justifying the flesh. We've got an excuse for not praying every time, and it's a good excuse. You know, well, Brother Hamby, I would have, but you know, I'll tell you what, things have happened lately. Well, things that happen should never be more important than prayer. Never more important than prayer. Everybody still here with me? The call to prayer should be the most important call of your life. Your girlfriend calling shouldn't be nearly as important as a call to prayer. Boyfriend calling you on the phone, sitting around waiting for your boyfriend to call you, shouldn't be nearly as important as a call to prayer. You say, well, my husband's been out two weeks working on construction crew. I sure wish he'd call. That call shouldn't mean any more to you than that still small voice that bid you go and pray today while you were standing at the washing machine. That call is the most important call you'll ever hear. It's the call where God says, come on up here with me into the cockpit. I want to show you some things I'm going to do. I want you to come up here and share in my will. I want you to come up here and intercede. I want you to come up here and take a part in what's going on in my great plan. Hallelujah. We've got to quit justifying the flesh because there's always a reason why we can wait till later. And then there's a reason why that waits till later. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And then that waits till later. And then you find yourself at the end of the day, you didn't pray. And in the morning you say, I'll tell you what, tomorrow is the day that I'm going to start praying. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. And tomorrow gets here, that busy day happens just like yesterday happened. 
And you say, well, now I'll tell you what, I'm going to do it this week. And some of us have put that off tomorrow, next week, one time after another, until prayer has gone unattended and the voice and the call to prayer has been seared. 